All right, kids, in October of 2021, while looking for a job, I came across this listing on LinkedIn looking for digital news content creators. This post was from TYT. I applied for the job thinking that I wouldn't hear anything back, got an interview almost six weeks later, accepted the position in early December, started in January of 2022, and 22 months later, after making 527 videos for Rebel HQ, plus being featured on dozens of TYT's live shows, I'm out. And it was them that got rid of me. Embarrassing considering everything that goes on there, but we're gonna talk about it today. Now, I debated myself the last few weeks about doing this because there's no need to even mention why and how some partnerships don't work out. It'd be like that sometimes. Plus, I don't wanna come off as a bitter, entitled prima donna. I mean, I am all of those things, but again, I don't wanna come off that way. However, many of you know me from that network and there are some lessons to be learned here that I will share which can be used by other content creators. Whether or not they make videos for digital media companies or independently or freelance to do a little bit of both like I did. Where you don't get benefits like healthcare and your check comes once a month and taxes aren't taken out of it, so you gotta be careful. With that said, when I signed my contract with CYT to be in their partner program, it pretty much said that they own my work that I do for them and can do whatever they want with it in perpetuity. It would be up to me to research, write, record, edit, and produce these videos, at least four per week, by myself, and get help from my assigned publisher who would send me pitches and any resource I might ask for, like, articles and B-roll. I could turn down pitches or pitch a new story myself. Either way, the TYT publisher would post my videos on Rebel HQ's YouTube channel and Facebook page and take care of tag, title, and thumbnail themselves. As for getting paid, there was a flat rate per video and I can earn bonuses if said videos gain over a million views that month. And I did that my first month, earned that. January, 2022, over a million views across 16 videos. Here are my first two that I worked on. The first one that I finished and gave to them and the first one that they posted. Sometimes I wondered why they posted videos when they did. A few weeks in came my first lesson about TYT and really probably all digital media companies. Going viral covers a multitude of mediocrity. Like even if the rest of my videos did say 30,000 views per, but one got 464,000 like this Blacks for Trump video, which made up more than 45% of my views that first month, it's all good. That was my second highest viewed video during my time there too. Anyways, in February, I got over 850,000 views and I realized that I wanted to be a digital content creator full time. Not with TYT, I just, I knew that the person who hired me was well connected and had networked for much of their career. Yet, when I emailed them about any opportunities they may know in the biz, they responded to me like I was asking to be paid full time by TYT after only 30 days on a job. They took the liberty to remind me of how the great David Schuster, who was an anchor with MSNBC and was there at the start of Fox News, went from being a freelancer to being full time on staff after nine months and millions of views. And I hadn't achieved anything close to that yet. So I was like, nah, I'm talking about a podcast or something at a different company that you may know about. Just trying to leave my day job. And they were just like, oh, okay. I understand the ask now. He never said this, but I think it was a money saving decision on the part of TYT to make him full time. David must have been earning so much money from bonuses. He was the king in terms of views, likely still is. Not bad for a Michigan man. I was chasing his numbers the whole time I was there. Look at the most successful videos on the Rebel HQ channel. Most of them are him. I got a chance to talk to him one-on-one -on -one a few times in order to pick his brain about making content and he told me that he had no notes for me. It meant a lot coming from him. It let me know that my style was real. After a while, when he would talk to me, he would assume TYT must have brought me on staff and wanted to do more projects with me, but nah, appreciate him though. Also, that February, I found out that I would get to co-host Indisputable with Dr. Rishi, which was a cool and unexpected perk that came along with the job. Man, for him to see my work and want me to contribute to his show was everything. I'm not gonna act like I know him, but he seems to be the same person on and off the air, and that was refreshing. Okay, fast forward. After February, my views slowly crept down each month until the summer. And what I'm about to say and admit is important for the rest of what I'm gonna tell you. It was my fault. I was the reason why my views were tanking my first six months. I said that to them. 
I was talking about whatever I wanted, nothing timely or trending. I didn't take into account that, in my opinion, the average Rebel HQ viewer is a 45-year-old liberal white man from the Midwest. That's not something TYT told me either, although they agreed when I asked if that was the case. I figured it out over time. Here's a sample of what I was doing. Why? I didn't tailor my videos towards what I knew about the audience. Partially didn't want to, but I was already aware of this and admitted as much to the team during analytics meetings, which took place every two weeks or once a month as needed. So when I got an email in late June, I think it was my birthday actually, saying my viewership or lack thereof wasn't sustainable, I already knew what I needed to do. And I did that. Here's the first two videos I gave to them afterward. So it was all good a week later. I gotta say one thing about that email. I was told that in order to be more successful, I should take more pitches from my publisher and do less Ohio news-based stuff. And I was given these two examples to go by. For one, I pitched both of these. Two, this is an Ohio-based news story. What? I... So I kept this misinfo in the back of my mind as I went along. July was the second time in six months that I crossed 1 million views. August, I got 1.4 million and I saw 2.4 million in September. So since I was rolling, I decided to quit my day job and bet on myself making content full time. This would free me up to do more appearances on live shows. I would do eight to 10 videos for Rebel HQ a week and then make videos for my YouTube channel every 10 days or so. It was kind of like the Kanye thing. Produce dope stuff for others, but save some of those beats for yourself. September of 2022, realizing that I needed to step my promotion and exposure game up, I go back to the person who hired me, email them and ask what the criterion was to co-host more of TYT's live shows. I had done Indisputable multiple times to that point, but none of the others. And if views or personal viewpoints were what gave people favor, I thought I had that. Furthermore, I saw that other people in the partner program were making regular appearances on the watch list, damage report, and the main show. Not everybody, sure, but why wouldn't I get an invite? They weren't doing or saying anything that I wasn't. And I hope that I never forget the reply that I got back. Quote, to be on the Young Turks and some of our other live programming, you must have a demonstrated comprehensive facility with topics like progressive policies, the political landscape entirely, facility with economy, international politics, climate science policy, to name just a few, and you haven't quite covered those topics. I'm gonna pause right there. Even if it was the case that I hadn't demonstrated a comprehensive facility with the topics they named, they would be missing all the other things I bring to the table, which the TYT audience had found valuable up until then. This person also repeated back to me something I said to them when I interviewed for the job, which was, I didn't feel as comfortable talking about politics as much as I did with social commentary. And that was true nine months before that. So they were holding that against me. And any social or political commentator will tell you, Talking about something like climate change, for example, on this here app won't get you views, as important as it is. So if I make a video where I explain climate science well and it gets 8,000 views, but I make another one making fun of MTG and it gets 470,000 views, my video with the most views, will my take on global warming get me on the damage report? Come on. My strategy was working. And they knew that because the rest of that paragraph read, actually, you shouldn't cover as we are working on a specific content strategy for you to have success with Rebel HQ, which again, should be your focus. So there's that. They also told me that I will begin to make appearances on the watch list in a few weeks with J.R. Jackson, which I did. He was also great. So September, October, November, December of 2022 were a breeze. I was averaging 2 million views per month going into the new year, making 28 to 32 videos per month. But behind the scenes, three other creators in the partner program reached out to me to see if I could help them get more views. I'm not gonna name names, but these were talented individuals who felt like they couldn't crack the algorithm or figure out the TYT audience. Not that I'm great or anything, but I think I'm at the very least approachable and accessible. I told them the little bit that I knew and sadly, it didn't work out for those three people. 
Their fate was the same as many others. I would follow them later. And this is how I learned what the beginning of the end looks like with TYT and how much of your success is out of your hands. February of 2023, my best month, almost 2.9 million views in 29 videos, the closest I ever got to that coveted 100,000 views per video mark. And that was great because March of 2023 was possibly my worst month. Views more than chopped in half, fell off of a cliff. And I was already aware of how important titles and thumbnails were to success on YouTube, but geez. And just as long as everything remained the same on my part with my average view duration and percentage viewed rate pretty much similar month to month, those are metrics I control by the way, title and thumbnail carry the day. My success and the success of millions of creators is hitched to the click-through rate. Still, I felt like March was a one-off bad month. The spring of 2023, earlier this year, I started to hear about Cenk Uyghur and Anna Kasparian saying anti-trans right-wing type stuff, and I didn't know much about it because I never watched their show. I had no idea of what I wanted to do or say about it. I wondered if I should quit working with TYT, but I figured the host of the other shows should do some of the heavy lifting. I was a freelancer. With that said, I could maintain my position and my stance and oppose Chank and Anna about trans communities through videos I was already making for the platform while calling attention to what was going on in my own way. I'm a mother, a mother, not a birthing person. I earned that right with my cellulite and my stretch marks. This whole don't call me a birthing person thing that the host of a show for the company that I freelance for made famous reminds me that there are things that I don't want to be called. Before I continue, Benny Carolla. Prior to even starting with TYT, I reached out to a few of the contributors to see if they could show me the ropes and some didn't even respond and others didn't give me the time. But Benny did and laid out everything I needed to know that made her her successful with TYT. It was so nice of her to do that. She didn't have to. And I was simultaneously glad when she went on to leave TYT, but I was frustrated that she had to. I hope I didn't let her down. The month of May comes after a decent April. Views are back down, but this time it feels different. And then I was told during our analytics meeting that the 100,000 views per video thing was a financial break even point. And that had never been said to me before, at least I don't remember any of that. That 100K threshold pays for me, the creator, and the publisher, and so on. So starting in July, I got four strategies and recommendations. One, do less videos per week. Two, take all of the publisher's pitches. I couldn't pitch anything myself. Three, focus on Trump supporter content. Four, one-liner in between clips. Let me explain that last one. I was told to show a clip of something, say a sentence, play another clip, one more sentence, and an additional clip, then add context, details, and nuance like I usually do. This was supposed to keep the audience and maintain average percentage viewed, but my entire time in the program, that metric rarely went under 55% for me. Meanwhile, when things were falling apart, my CTR was under nine in June and never got above 11.67 during my final four months there. Back when I was banging, that rate was 14.29. I can't stress enough, I did not do title and thumbnail myself. I wish they would have come out and just said, we haven't been marketing you the way we should or used to. We're not holding our end of the bargain. Now, this is where I want y'all to advocate for yourselves better than I did because this decision not only impacted my income, but these things weren't the reasons why my views went downhill and they for damn sure weren't going to push them back up. It's not like the other creators in the program who found success were doing these things exclusively or I used to do them and then I stopped. Oh, and when I got around to asking how many other creators actually earned 100,000 views per video, I was told, most of them did. Okay. Wow. No one ever told me though, whether my click through rate, average view duration, or average percentage viewed were on par with others either. Needless to say, none of that worked. That's clearly why I'm sitting here talking to you about this now. One last gasp of an effort was to make longer videos over five minutes or so, but videos for Rebel HQ were required to be at least three minutes and five seconds. Also, another publisher caught a TikTok of mine and the team encouraged me to make content for them like this. 
How do you do, fellow Americans? It's me, Tim Scott. I'm just like you. I eat McDonald's, I like baseball, I wear pants, and I'm called all manner of N-words at the suggestion that enslaved black people didn't learn beneficial skills while in chains. I'm an American doing normal things, taking pictures of my McDonald's like it's new and unique. Not sure of why I'm holding my fries like this. Traditional values, conservative. Okay, look... Tim Scott might be pretending to be something he's not. This may now include his status as a single 59-year-old black man running for president because GOP donors are wondering about his personal life, which is why, in Iowa, he said this. It's been one of the more asked questions recently. I do. I'm dating a lovely Christian girl. She doesn't even go to this school. You wouldn't know her. Actually, she's the one who took this picture. Tim Scott's going to have to keep talking about this lovely Christian girl all because... His political party thinks he's gay. We meet your girlfriend? You will, of course. Some nah. Save all them good beats for myself. My last day with Rebel HQ was November 4th, although I'm scheduled to co-host Indisputable in December. But there you have it. That's what happened. My last few months in the program didn't do me any favors. Not much of a partnership when one side fails the other. That applies to both sides, me and them. I'm proud of my work and what we were able to accomplish, though. I'm thankful for what they did for me. TYT helped raise my profile. My YouTube channel has more views and subscribers due to my time there. I'm a pretty stubborn person and I'm resolute when it comes to my craft. And I gotta be honest, there are moments when I question if I sucked. Was I not good? But then again, look at the Rebel HQ roster and who used to create content for them. Jessica Burbank is doing well for herself, and I think she left TYT. The Conscious Lee has over 2 million TikTok followers, and the program didn't work out for him either. Sometimes, talent and network don't match. Remember that. I will say, check Rebel HQ's numbers. I'm willing to bet that if you compare what they've done from September of 2022 to those in March of 2023, and include September of 2023, I bet views are declining. I may have been asked to leave a sinking ship. I hope not. I still root for individuals to succeed. Ravana, Yasmin Khan, Max Burns. Sheesh. One day he DM'd me out of nowhere and said that it was great to share a channel with me. Come on now. If TYT valued me like they did with other people, I would have been given more chances to venture out past Rebel HQ. But now... My plan is to beat them down. Some people get more opportunities than others. That's everywhere, all the time. But on the off chance that I hear somebody got to do something I didn't, I'm like, you're sticking with that motherfucker? <laughs> Are you serious? They said they didn't want me, and I know what that means. I know what that feels like, and I'm gonna fuck you up because of that. <laughs> Today, I work at a local high school. I'm still trying to figure out my next steps. Some of you may know what my dream job is, and Roy Wood Jr. just left The Daily Show last month, so there's an open slot for a correspondent. Even Roy explained why he left, but I've been trying to get their producer's attention. So with my news anchor sign off that I borrowed from Childish Gambino, not sure if this is gonna be the last time I use it, and this channel that I named after a Kendrick Lamar song, I leave you with this. As I get a little older, I realize life is perspective, and my perspective may differ from yours. I wanna say thank you to everyone that's been down with me. All my fans, all my beautiful fans, anyone who's ever given me a listen, all my people. For We Gonna Be Alright, I'm Jeff Wiggins. My architect knows Japanese.